Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Warm welcome on behalf of Relega Private Wealth and the entire Relega family. Regret the delayed start. Traffic, as usual, is bad in Delhi. We're expecting some more people to turn up. Uh, so, as you know, we are here to actually discuss the post-budget impact and what better day than a day when the Sensex has seemingly breached 30K. Repo rate cut, welcome surprise. Lots of good news, good budget, but more on that, you know, on a vibrant panel discussion. Uh, but before we actually hit the panel discussion, I request Mr. Shachindranath, the group CEO of Relige, to actually come and address the audience and give you his perspective on this gathering. Mr. Nath. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be very short and brief. Uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel. Thank you, Nilesh. Thank you, Vay, Kenneth, and Mr. P. N. Vijay. So I won't bore you from a, for, for a long speech. It's indeed a privilege for all of us uh, at Relegate to host you. Uh, <clears throat> as Subranshu was saying, that I, we think that this gathering would grow up and will get come to full size. Uh, we have tried to not only bring knowledge, but bring some fun to you as well. Uh, it's in a stressful life. It, we think that when we throw you and with, with high degree of knowledge, we should throw you and lighten up as well. <clears throat> One other thing uh, which has been a matter of great pride uh, for all of us, uh, I've been in Relegate for 16 years, is the depth and the spread of businesses which we do. Sometimes I, <clears throat> because we are slightly larger business, uh, in financial services industry, sometimes uh, it is difficult for people to really understand and know what we do. People know Religare uh, in terms of where they interact. People interact with some of our arms and they feel that that's, <coughs> that's what our business is. So I'll take just five minutes just to broadly explain you who we are, what we do, so that you get a better perspective of our businesses. So <coughs> as you may know, I don't know whether the slide is there. Is there? Okay. As you may know, Religar is a <coughs> listed company in India. The way we define ourselves, we are an integrated financial services business in India. We tend to serve, and that's our endeavor, serve all formats of client and customer. We serve rural, we serve mass <coughs> retail, we serve affluent, we serve SMEs, we serve mid-market corporate, and we serve large number of global institutions. <coughs> we are a truly professionally managed company, a billion dollar of, of market cap, $700 million of revenues, uh, come back to very strong profitability and taking the benefit of the expected growth which will come into the marketplace. Uh, while it, from an outside, some people think we do a lot of things, but actually we do four simple things. Uh, we are uh, four businesses. We are a very large lending organization in India, uh, which is our predominantly covers 50% of our revenue. We in India would have served almost 32,000 SMEs. Uh, we tend to call ourselves an asset finance business. We provide growth capital in form of debt to a very large population of entrepreneurs uh, in form of SMEs. So that's our largest business. Our <clears throat> second largest business is what we call capital market and wealth group, uh, of which this business is also a part of that. Our capital market consists of a very large retail business, which has been the oldest business for us. We serve almost 1.4 million customers. Uh, we operate out of 600 locations, 210 branches, 3,000 odd people. And <clears throat> we provide execution and advisory-led brokerage business. We have an institutional capital market business. We serve institutional clients. Uh, we are present across India, Singapore, and Hong Kong. We serve almost 730 global institutional clients. And in India and Singapore, we focus on equity capital market for mid-market companies. And then we have wealth, which used to be actually a joint venture with Macquarie. Our view is that Indian businesses and Indian clients are better served by us itself. And with that objective, actually, we acquired Macquarie's stake in our wealth business. And that's also part <coughs> of our business. We are uh, a large asset advisor. So this is an independent business. Uh, and try to be much closer to its client base and try to be a good asset allocated to you. So that's our capital market, institutional retail and wealth business. Third is insurance. We are in a health insurance company. We are also a life insurance company where we are exiting from that business actually. Our health insurance company is <coughs> the fourth largest health, health insurance company in India, growing phenomenally. We feel that India has a highly underserved market as far as health is concerned, both from the delivery side as well as from the coverage side. 
And fourth, <clears throat> which is slightly unknown business to people, we are a very large global asset management business. We are roughly around <clears throat> 1 lakh 50,000 crores, so $23 billion total asset under management. Uh, we have two components of our asset management business. We have a mutual fund business in India, which is around 25,000 crore. Predominantly, we are a fixed income manager there, and now growing equity business as well. It's a top quartile asset management company. We have an Invesco, which is a global fund house, as our joint venture partner. And we have a global asset management business in the alternative asset management space, <clears throat> which is predominantly we tend to have multiple businesses around private equity and private equity style of investing, when we are now managing almost 20 odd billion dollars. We own businesses in San Francisco called Northgate Partners, which is a very large venture capital private equity fund of fund business. We own Landmark Partners, which is world's founder of secondary private equity business, have been generating 25% IRR in dollar terms for the last 25 years consistently. In Asia, we have an Asia healthcare fund, we have a uh, healthcare REIT, we have private equity <coughs> real estate, we have a uh, REIT business in India, uh, we have angel fund in India. So a variety of asset management business. Our aspiration is that we bridge the, the capital flow from west to east, uh, and when emerging markets start growing, we should get benefit and should be able to bring to all form of clients high quality of alpha generation capability, and that's what we have, we have been focused and we have been doing. So in sum, we are four businesses, capital market, lending, insurance, and asset management. Our objective and the way we are set up as an independent financial services company, to be close to all of you in whatever format you operate with us, <clears throat> whether you are an institution, whether you are a corporate, whether you are a mid-market corporate, SME, or a wealth client, we should be able, we should serve you to best of our ability. We don't tend or we don't profess that we are best in what we do, but we always try to be the best what we do. And we do it with a lot of passion and commitment. Uh, we feel this is our business for long term, and we want to be with you for a very long period of time. When it comes to wealth, I keep telling all my team, for us, the wealth business is the gateway to Religare. Uh, in India, our view is that in the next 20 years, entrepreneurship would take big boost, and every entrepreneur would need an advisor across every spectrum of activity which they do. It's not just about your private wealth or private investment activity, but whenever you need any form of services, uh, our wealth team should be evolved enough to bring every component of Relegate to you, or even from outside. And that's our endeavor. That's why we have kept our wealth team small, and they are all have been here three or four years plus, and we try to impart knowledge, because this is a business of knowledge and experience. We try to impart them that knowledge, which allows you to, us to serve you better. So, <clears throat> so that's what Relegate is for you. It's indeed my pleasure to have all of you, and I thank all of you to sp my spare and spend some time this evening. And I'm sure the evolved panel which we have and uh, the stand-up community both would, you'll enjoy and relish very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot, Mr. Nath, for setting the context. So, you know, just to kind of brief the audience here, the panel discussion is also going live to a broader audience, Pan India. So, you know, it's actually going through a webcast here as we speak to a bunch of people who are sitting from their homes, looking at it from their mobile, and also a whole lot of people across some of our regional offices and branches. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Vivek Law, uh, the moderator of the panel discussion. Vivek, as you know, is a distinguished uh, business journalist with an experience of almost two decades, former editor of Bloomberg UTV. Vivek, thanks for having, uh, I mean, pleasure to have you over, and thanks for really agreeing to moderate the discussions. I'd uh, like to now welcome the panelists, the esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Nilesh Shah, CEO of Kota KMC. Thank you, Nilesh, for sparing time and being here. Mr. Kenneth Andrade, Head of Investments for IDFC AMC. And of course, our very own Mr. P.N. Vijay, an independent financial services and capital markets commentator, and also a group advisor to Relega. Thank you all for being here. So, Vivek, over to you, all yours.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, for making time to come to this uh, extremely special panel. Today is a momentous day. We've uh, crossed some very important milestones, but for the people who are sitting on this panel, this is just one of the many milestones that they've seen in an exceptional career, which perhaps is well over two decades. These are market masters. These are people who have built serious wealth for those whose money they have managed. And therefore, it's indeed a pleasure. Not only are all three of them uh, people who I admire tremendously over my two decades of my career, but uh, they're also people who are not just good at what they do, but they also command a lot of integrity and credibility. So thank you very much, all three of you, for coming by. Uh, since we are running a bit late, I'm going to keep uh, my part of the questions uh, and that session a little short, and I'm going to therefore try and give more time uh, to you all to be able to ask questions uh, to these three gentlemen. We are not going to be discussing specific stocks here, uh, because as I said in the introduction, these are three people who have built serious wealth for people, I'm presuming. Uh, that you've come here to get some understanding of how to make some serious wealth. Uh, of course, the topic today is being constructed around the budget, but I think uh, we will also try and spend a little bit more of our time in trying to understand what next over the next few months and years. It was a very big event. Uh, perhaps uh, very few budgets have carried this kind of anticipation as much as this budget did. So while we'll quickly get into trying to understand whether this budget really met the expectations, but I think more importantly, that event is now behind us. What does the future look like, I think, is what we should try and spend some more time on. All right, uh, so I'll quickly get on with my first set of questions. Mr. Vijay, incidentally, is not only the advisor to Religare, the group advisor, but he's also the BJP spokesperson. So in your question answer session, if you have some criticism of this budget, you know where to direct it to. Uh, but of course, today he is wearing his other avatar of being uh, a market master for many, many years. So let me set the context with my opening question to all three of you. Was this a good budget, or would you call this an exceptional budget? Nilesh? I will call this an exceptional budget. In my recent career, this is the first budget where I don't doubt the credibility of the budget. Normally, the budget had revenue overestimated and expenditure underestimated. This is the first budget where, end on heart, I can say that revenue is underestimated and expenditure is fully provided for. So this is the first budget where the data, the numbers are reliable. Second, this is one budget where they have listened to the market. I'll recommend all of you to go and visit cnbcawas.com where there's a booklet called Big Budget Ideas. And the only declaration I have to make is that I have also contributed into that <laughs> booklet. But a lot of things which came in the budget, like removal of permanent establishment, like, which allows Indian fund managers to sit abroad to manage money in India, and which is why Mumbai cannot become Singapore or Hong Kong. One stroke of law, it has been removed. The gold bond scheme, we have written extensively about it, that's being inducted. The national India infrastructure and investment, how do you leverage your capital, that's being planned for. So for the first time, we have seen that government actually listens. They actually listen to the market participants. And based on that, they are launching budget. So maybe we are a bit biased because what we wanted is already there in the budget. Do, do, you, do you wish you had wanted more? I always believe in that Pepsi saying, <laughs> they didn't mange more. <laughs> I'll come to what you would have liked to see and it didn't happen, but that's in just a bit. But First, your opening comments. Uh, was this an exceptional budget or a work-in-progress budget? Because I know a lot is made of this big bang word, right? 
uh, is, I think it's a media creation, that every budget we, we say that is this a big bang budget, big bang reforms. Uh, has that whole definition changed? Was it a good work in progress budget taking India? It talked about a seven year vision statement in the very beginning of the speech. I think uh, whatever it was, it was not, it was not a big bang. And I think there was a, a thought that things could go on. There was nothing sensationally that India wanted, very different from 1991. And I think it was uh, surely, uh, uh, I wouldn't say it was a politically correct budget, in fact. In fact, some of the uh, middle class and common people have been disappointed. And there was a perception that after the drubbing the BJP got in, in, in Delhi, there would be some amount of populism. There's absolutely no populism in the way Modi campaigned. It was purely development, development, and so forth. But the first remarkable thing was it was put away. There was very little of politics in this budget. And apart from the credibility of numbers, when Chidambaram announced certain numbers, oh God, how are you going to get those numbers, you know? Even when he put a nice fiscal deficit figure, people felt, oh, this is going to take some achieving. Uh, the numbers are credible. And some of these are transformational, you know. Uh, I get the sense that the media probably has not uh, talked enough about it. Uh, one is, if you looked at the uh, employment to GDP ratio, uh, growth ratio, which the survey put out uh, a day earlier, uh, it showed that we really have been having jobless growth. The, the, uh, the jobs have been growing at about 1.8 or 1.7%, whereas the GDP has been growing uh, in real terms at about 6 and nominal about 12 to 13, which meant that there's a serious issue. So the best way to tackle that problem is, where, is, where are the jobs? They are in the SMEs. The Ligar, we know that, which is why the, the focus is totally in the investing side and in the lending side and the SMEs. And the Mudra Bank, I tell you, because banks just don't want to lend to SMEs. That could have a multiplier effect and the credit guarantee being given to banks to lend to SMEs. That is one transformational thing. The other is using your jandan to reach to almost 11 crore people on cash transfer. We've all been sitting in seminars and saying that 45% of food is wasted, 55% of kerosene is wasted, 60% of LPG is wasted, etc. But for the first time, we are going to have uh, the, the subsidies being directed a lot, lot better. I'm not surprised that the fair price uh, shop owners association has gone on strike because they're getting irrelevant, uh, seriously. So these are certain things which are hitting at the root of long-standing problems. And apart from the investment of 70,000 crores and railway budget had a one lakh, uh, thousand, one lakh crores, etc. These are some of the f uh, small print which has the capacity to transform uh, India and make the growth a lot more spread up. You know, not confine it to the, uh, to the bottom, uh, to the top layers of the pyramid, but take it down to the lower. Level. So I'm having very high expectation that this will really create wealth in the community. Kenneth, uh, your opening thoughts. It was more of a consolidation budget than an expansionary budget, and that's what we essentially liked about the entire thing. So purely from a corporate analyst point of view, uh, what, uh, what was the best thing that happened in this budget is we did not throw too much of money at the economy. And this is the second budget in a row where, you, where you've seen that's not happening. And that's, uh, that's very important because uh, if, you, if you look at the transformation of India uh, into, into 2015, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, corporate India has grown balance sheet almost by 7, seven x okay? and that's a huge increase in, in, in capital employed in the entire system. Uh, the second part of the problem remains all of it is not profitable and, and you have not been able uh, and you've not been able to take that capital and reinvest it back into the economy. So that the problem with India re uh, and, and the infrastructure and kick-starting the economy through a capital spend remains that corporates can't really follow up. So the material change that we see with uh, what's been happening over the last couple of couple, couple of uh, m months is that you're consolidating the economy. You want profitability to come back. You have, need your assets to go up, 
and uh, and then you start kickstart the entire investment cycle all over again. I think that's the moot point that's and the moot change that has actually happened. Don't expand your budget too much. Consolidate it. Uh, allow corporates to uh, to 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 generate higher profitability and then reinvest and go forward. Uh, and you believe this budget did all of this? Uh, it's done a significant part of it. As long as you're not expanding, not throwing more money at the entire corporates, I think their focus on, is more on cash generation. Mm -hmm. One of the big concerns, uh, Mr. Vijay, which especially the credit rating agencies have had, is on the entire fiscal deficit roadmap. You know, uh, if you go back to the first budget, I remember last July, almost everyone in the market was willing to allow him to go past 4.1 given the economic situation. Even the global rating agencies were all right. If at that point he had exceeded 4.1, he stuck his neck out. He said, no, I will do 4.1. Uh, now when the, in his own admission, when the economy is turning around, when people expected him, or at least the credit rating agencies expected him to stick to the target, he's actually gone past it, and he's going to have to make an amendment even to the FRBM. How, how do you view that? Do you think that was avoidable? Well, it was surely avoidable, but I got the sense the government uh, uh, didn't want to avoid it. I mean, didn't, uh, they've taken their agencies head on. I think that shows a, a certain amount of self-confidence, uh, as has been shown by the RBI has accepted that. It's very unusual to, for the RBI to cut rates after some fiscal uh, the fiscal roadmap is extended. That's normally bad news for inflation. Uh, but the thing is, what is the prescription right now for the disease we have? The investment to GDP ratio has just crashed out. It's at 30. The savings to GDP ratio is just gone out of, out of uh, whack. So you need to kickstart, really kickstart the economy. The private sector is sulking. All its wealth is in mutual funds, liquid mutual funds which shows a lack of confidence uh, in putting their money where their mouth is. So the government has to carry the can. Now, you could have invested less. You could have uh, not had the, uh, you know, uh, the last minute funding for NHA, et cetera, and, and not had admitted that one year slippage. That was an obvious choice because the, uh, the, the, the capital expenditure was within your side, side, but chose not to do it. I think it was a conscious decision we may not get that uh, upgrade unless there's a tax policy, and as Nilesh was saying, we may improve on the tax earnings. The other thing, Vivek, many people are not factoring into their math, is the 14th Finance Commission. Never in the history of the 14 Finance Commissions has the allocation changed by such a huge whack, by 10%. Uh, for the audience, what I'll explain is that as per Finance Commission, the tax revenues that are collected by the government, whatever tax, excise duties, the central government, have to be shared by the constitution in a particular fashion. And the latest award says that from 32%, the states will get 42%, which is a huge jump, 183,000 crores just in 15-16. So there, there was going to be uh, a, a shortfall in the center's revenue. They have tried their best to move some uh, schemes to the states. But then the rating agencies would understand that this is the year before GST kicks in, this is the year of the Finance Commission, and I think the mood of the uh, rating agencies is probably give these guys a chance. This is about the only growing economy in the world. Uh, let it grow. Yeah, sure. Nilesh, please add to that, and then I'll ask you my next question. So I have a question for rating agency. Since recorded human history, India has never defaulted to foreigners, right from Harappa Mohichandra days till today. <laughs> so about 5,000 years of track record is there for Indians, but we haven't defaulted to any foreigner. Now let's look at a country like Greece. In the recorded history of Greece, in the last 400 years, they have defaulted 20 times. <laughs> and for bulk of this period, their rating is higher than Indians. So does the rating agency have one rating for white people and one rating for black people? <laughs> trust, you, trust you to take this to a different level. But, uh, the same but question is coming. Okay. I have okay. not yet finished with rating agencies. <laughs> okay, okay. So but you what, can't ignore them either, right? Fund flows 
do get affected by what they say, whether you agree with what they say or disagree with what they say. <laughs> okay. So the second question is that what does rating signify? The textbook definition of rating is that it signifies credit quality of the person, whether he'll be able to pay or not. So my grandmother told me that person who is rich, who is creditor, he should have higher rating. In person who is borrowing, we should have lower rating. Logical. The world's largest debtor is America. But they have triple A rated rating. The world's largest creditor is China or Japan. But they have double A and A plus rating. So somewhere, where does rating agency's equation starts? The debtor is more higher rated. The creditor is more lower rated. So lower the rating better for us. And which is why we are a triple B minus. So are, are you saying, Nilesh, that uh, your point is perfectly well taken. You've explained it and you can gather from the audience as well. But uh, on a serious note, uh, given all the, uh, you know, the silly approach that they adopt perhaps, but the fact of the matter is that it does spook markets, isn't it? So let's now ask third question to rating agency. I am supposed to be the one asking you questions. <laughs> so what is the global economy today and in which this economy ratings are given? So let's assume that I was running a beer bar and all of you were my customers. You were coming once a week, twice a week at best. I was happy with my business, you were happy with my beer. Now economy is into recession, you stopped coming to my beer. So I need to encourage you. So I made an offer to you that you can all come and visit my beer bar, drink as much as you want, and you can make the payment whenever you can. I trust you are all my good customers. So you can make the payment whenever you have the ability to pay. So instead of once a week, now you started visiting once a day. My business went up seven times. You were happy, I was happy. Now there was someone who was supplying beer to me. I started purchasing seven times more. He was happy. Then there was banker who was giving credit to me so that I can buy beer. He was happy because his credit went up seven times. So we created a situation where customer is happy, owner is happy, banker is happy, supplier is happy. Isn't this a very happy situation? Of course all of you agree it's happy. Now. There is a trader on the street. He said that, look, your debtor is going up. So why don't I securitize this and give it to some Japanese investors? So he securitizes receivable from my customer who are not going to pay and puts into the global market. Now customer is happy, supplier is happy, banker is happy, the owner is happy, the trader is happy, the rating agency is happy, and the Japanese investor is also happy. So this is how the happy world is. And the rating agencies rate them as AAA rated and we saw in subprime, they were all rated AAA just before they went bankrupt. So let's not give too much importance to the rating agencies. And the most important thing is the market verdict. Today India is borrowing at a rate which is better than AA plus and AA rated countries. Why are bankers giving us at a rate which is applicable to double A and double A plus rated countries when our rating is triple B minus. In the understanding of global banks, they believe India is a better credit worthy nation. I am hopeful that someday rating agencies will become wise enough like other global bankers who are putting their money. The person who puts his money is far, far superior to the person who just has to opine, isn't it? Hmm. Now can I ask you something in the answer and not ask a question? Okay. Have you already started looking more at the Brent crude on the tickers than the Sensex or the Nifty? Because you talked about credible numbers, you talked about you know, it being an exceptional budget, but you would agree that it relies a lot on oil staying where it has been staying for the last few months. What is the probability according to you, and is that a very big risk? Because if oil was to turn back, uh, then all these numbers that we are all very happy about will all not even 
uh, you know, uh, stand scrutiny at all. What are your views? In fact, I'll get Mr. Vijay also to talk on that. So one, you know, predicting crude is a very, very dangerous job. Last time there was a gentleman called Mr. Arjun Murthy who became a hero predicting oil to go from 150 to 200. Oil never touched 200 and he lost his job. So I want my job. I don't want to predict crude. But there are a couple of observations which I have on crude market. One, US was the largest consumer of oil. Now, they are the net, neither importer nor exporter, they are self-sufficient in crude. Second, a company which makes iPhone and iPad, that company's market cap, and all of you have contributed to it by using Apple's iPhone and iPad, is more than entire Russia's market cap, which is supposedly oil-based economy. So in one iPhone, iPad equivalent company, you can get almost two times Russia, which is 25% of world's gas reserve and 17% of land mass, and some aluminum, bauxite, and iron ore are free. So it shows market's verdict on oil sustainability. They certainly believe that an iPhone is worth more than a barrel of oil. Mm. Third, there is a country called Brazil, which raised $27 billion. What we received in entire year, they raised in one rights issue for a company called Petrobras Limited. And that company with that $27 billion in pocket is developing a field called Tupi, which is an offshore field, which is supposedly of as big size as entire Saudi Arabia. So if over the next four or five years, we are going to add a production equivalent to today's Saudi Arabia, and the world's largest consumer, US, is not going to buy oil, one can reasonably sure that hopefully oil prices will remain where they are, but not go sharp spiked up. And the reason why I said budget is credible, in the railway budget, they have taken oil assumption at $78 a barrel, when today's price is 61. And as the left arm of the government does not know what right arm does, the budget has provided oil at $70 a barrel, which is again higher than 61. So my guess is that if stars favor us, oil will not be an issue. Kenneth, do you agree with that assessment? Um, I mean, I'm with Nilesh in terms of trying to predict oil prices. No, I, I wasn't asking you all for a target price, but does that worry you? Uh, the manner in which, because so much seems to be dependent on it. Uh, I wouldn't really think so, uh, uh, like because in the near term, uh, in the near term, though it will have its impact. I think the biggest problem for India is the ability to price, to to utilize its capacity and pass on the pricing power. If we've been able to do that, I think we'll get our profitability back. Because we've just seen two months of uh, two quarters, where oil prices have been significantly low. Okay, neither has corporate India got a significant amount of benefit from it, though the government has. Okay, and uh, we've still been able to be relatively profitable at the government level. We've been able to control our fiscal deficit. Should the economy actually bounce back? I think your tax revenues will kick back over a period of time. Hmm. Uh, yes, please. A couple of other points on this which occurred to me. Uh, one is if you see the global uh, scenario, most of the producing countries have a vested interest in keeping on pumping oil. Whether it's Iran or Russia, because their economies are in very bad shape. In even Saudi Arabia doesn't want to uh, cut oil prices, I mean oil production, uh, because it, they're still making money uh, at this price. The second thing is, why did the oil dynamics in the world change? Because of something called shale gas, which the Americans are producing in, in huge quantities, which is why America, from being a huge importer, has not uh, stopped importing. Now, shale gas cost of production, depending on the field, is between 62 and 65 dollars. Now, the minute it goes above that, you'll get a huge ramp up in shale gas uh, production. So that's almost set a ceiling level on high, at what high, how high oil can go. And thirdly, uh, there is a serious uh, demand recession in many of the economies like uh, China and the EU. And except the US and India, I don't think consumption is really going up anywhere else. So even from the demand size, you expect uh, uh, very weak demand 
uh, in 2015 and first quarter of 2016. So from supply side, from alternative uh, petroleum resources side, and from uh, you know demand side, I think uh, it will be profitable to be bearish on oil. And as um, Nilesh just pointed out, uh, both these government budgets have been fairly conservative. So to that extent, the fiscal deficit numbers, I don't think, would be impacted. Right. Uh, last year has been a great year for investors, isn't it? Uh, they've made a fairly decent amount of money in equities. Uh, do you see further upside? And, and when I say further upside, I mean significant further upside. Uh, even close to what we saw last year? Or would that be asking for too much? And do you think 2015 will be a good place to be in would be debt? Do, do, you, do you feel that? Uh, last year was exceptional. We were trading at 12 times forward earning. We are now trading at 16 and a half times forward earning. So equities delivered 40% return on large cap 60% on mid caps and 80% on small cap because you not only got re-rating from a valuation point of view, but there was also marginal earnings growth. So if I have to simplify, 90% of return last year came because your P got re-rated and 10% return came because your earnings were higher. Now it will be unfair to assume that next year also I will get my P re-rating. I think from a P point of view, we make it marginally re-rated, but not much. So now bulk of the return has to come from earnings movement. As Kenneth mentioned, corporates have to make more money, more profit, and which is why we will give them more value. Now, FY16 earnings growth is more likely to be 12 to 15 percent, which means your returns will have to moderate. So FY16 or calendar year 2015 returns on equity will be lower than what you got in 2014. But the good news is that FY17 earnings could be far higher than FY16 and the earnings could be up by 20% plus. So if you have, if you have two year horizon, then you will get as much return what you get last year in one year. And the best part is that this year, you are going to get good return in both debt as well as equity. The governor has cut interest rates today morning. And I hope that he will continue to do that couple of times more over the next 18 to 24 months. Which means debt funds also will continue to give good return. So you have one unique advantage, whether you invest in debt or in equity, you can expect good returns, but in equity and debt, both the returns will be lower this year than they were last year. Do you broadly agree with those numbers? Uh, yeah, broadly in line with what Nile says, except uh, for the fact that 2016, uh, you you just might uh, uh, the earning cycle is not going to really catch catch up. Okay, we've we've got a quarter that has gone by, wherein earnings was actually negative. And that's happened after an extremely long period of time. Now, the momentum in corporate earnings has broken. For it to actually revive, get pricing power and come back, I think FY16 could, could continue to remain a disappointment. How we execute in 2017, it remains to be seen how macros pull through. Uh, and it's very important for macros to pull through and demand to get generated because there's an enormous amount of capacity that's sitting on the ground. A significant amount of capacity actually goes on production with uh, with uh, with uh, goes in production into 2017. And if that gets utilized, I think we will see a comeback of earnings out there. But capacities need to get utilized into 2017. So when I hear you explain it in this manner to me, Kenneth, I'm therefore then surprised that what is with the market sitting all time highs every day? Because, you know, corporate earnings are the basis, right? I mean, you can add to that a cherry of sentiment. But there clearly seems to be a huge disconnect. Is it about too much money chasing too few stocks out there? Well, if you look at the asset class across the world, uh, and if you look at the US, uh, US as an example, uh, earnings there is a, suppose, is expected or projected to go flat to negative going into the next year, but it's another market that's making its all-time high. Uh, and that's purely on the basis, uh, back, uh, basis of it's got an extremely strong currency behind it. 
So, I, uh, so investors are looking out for opportunities across the world. There are very few opportunities that are actually available. And uh, most of that money is actually coming into pockets like, uh, uh, like the US, India. And we've been, we've been the beneficiaries of all of that. So to, to a level, the asset class is, or equity as an asset class across the globe is going into, into, into a slight bubble mode. Uh, we stand out uh, given the fact that we have a reasonably long, long uh, um, uh, st story to talk about, given the fact that we are the young, young economy, 2% of world GDP, 17% uh, of population, uh, uh, the ability to grow, the ability to consume. So over the longer term, we, 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 we definitely can pull through the entire cycle. Near term, the question mark remains on how you value equities in, across the entire globe, especially when earnings are not going to bounce back at the same, same vengeance that it did in the, in the last decade. Hmm. Yes, please. See, today's market is Manmohan Singh, EPS, and Narendra Modi P. Sorry, come again. Today's market is Manmohan Singh, EPS, and Narendra Modi P. <laughs> in tomorrow's market will be Narendra Modi EPS and Narendra Modi P. That is what you have to invest. I, I'm getting the sense that you're looking for a different role for yourself. Five years from now. <laughs> or is it the Vijay effect? <laughs> it's a very good slogan for you. <laughs> Your party, I Mr. Vijay. I add uh, one more to this earnings, uh, earnings uh, uh, conversation that we are having. You know, uh, my experience is if all these fantastic fund managers, the icons of the industry, with all their calculations, etc., value a market at 100, the market can swing up to 125 or 75 due to two reasons. One is sentiment and the other is liquidity. Over extended periods of time, not for 10 days, 15 days, even 6 to 9 months, we have seen periods when they just defy logic. Mm. You know, people say, uh, what? Uh, are you saying we're in that phase? It's defying logic. We were, we were in that phase. I think last few days, I am getting a feeling that reality is a little bit catching up. And I wouldn't be surprised that uh, this uh, fluff factor, the fluff factor has been there, uh, you know, looking at, uh, uh, may just uh, go off. Mm. Because you can't have so many drinks in the bar, you know. The six drinks or something, you have to go home. That's when you pay your bartender or you, no. as, you as we will say, book profits. No, if but, you leave the party. But, but, but Mr. Vijay, it almost seems like there's only one drink, right? Everybody is just, it's just Narendra Modi. No, no, no. But several uh, swigs of the same drink. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> when you go, you don't have one whiskey, one rum, one brandy. Mm. You say one more patiala, one more patiala. You know, like that. We are on the third or fourth Patiala right now, <laughs> as far as from what these fund managers say. But, but you don't believe that... Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So this is on a serious note, okay? <laughs> we are about to finish the time in the Don't say this on a serious note. So why are people investing in India? So I'll take you... How many of you own Maruti car? <laughs> no, no, other people, are, 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 other people are lazy. <laughs> so, let's look at Maruti. Today it contributes about 30% of turnover to Suzuki Motor Corp in Japan. And if we calculate royalty correctly, 50% of profitability. Now, anyone who wants to invest in Suzuki Japan has to come and study Maruti India because it's a such significant component of con that company. Now, Maruti got listed in India in 2003. And Suzuki has been listed in Japan before I was born. Between 2003 to 2015, 12 years, Maruti has delivered return, which is 28 times more than Suzuki. How many times? All of you who have Maruti cars today, if you had bought Maruti shares, you would have been in Mercedes-Benz for sure. <laughs> but unfortunately, none of you realized that, so you kept on selling your Maruti shares, which is why Maruti is now owned by foreigners, not by Indians. And foreigners are smart enough to realize that there's no point in buying Suzuki. 
I might as well buy Maruti and make 28 times more return. Now you do this exercise across entire length and breadth of Indian companies. Hindustan Lever outperforms Unilever by a margin for the last 60 years. Nestle India outperforms Nestle AG Switzerland by big margin. Siemens India outperforms Siemens AG by big margin. Myco Bosch India outperforms Robert Bosch by big margin. Procter and Gamble outperforms PNG US by big margin. Gillette India outperforms Gillette US by big margin. GlaxoSmithKline Pharma outperforms GlaxoSmithKline BCAM UK by big margin. Company after company, every single Indian company has outperformed their multinational parent by big, 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 big margin. Foreigners know this, that's why they are buying our equity. We don't know this, that's why we are selling our equity and buying gold. And in the process, all right, uh, I'm going to take a few questions from the audience. If you have any of the three specific panelists in mind, you can direct your question at them. Otherwise, you can leave it to me. Please, no stock-specific questions. Uh, do we have mics across? Anyone has a question? Raise your hand. The gentleman here. Can we get a mic across there, please? You can take this. Yeah. You can take... Uh... Yes, sir. Go ahead. Very interesting to hear whatever has been said. Uh, two questions. One, what Mr. Shah just said. If India is that profitable, why don't we have a whole flood of FDI? Mm. After all, if I have $100 billion in Europe, why would I like to put FDI anywhere else except in India? Mm. But it doesn't seem to be so. Uh, are there other factors, corruption, infrastructure, that's stopping? That's point number one. And second question not related is that how come after so many quarters we are having low uh, earnings from the corporates? One would expect inflation is down, our CAD is down, uh, there's a new government. So one would have normally thought, logic would say that the earnings should have gone up. Why is that so? Sure. Uh, can I come to the second one? Um, I think the, the momentum of, uh, of corporate earnings is just uh, has been coming down for over the period of the last two years. A lot of things have got to do with the fact that uh, while top line has been increasing, margins have been completely squeezed because the cost of business has been doing uh, has been extremely expensive. But the last quarter was a particular uh, the interesting part of the last quarter was both top lines, there is sales growth and bottom lines have not been able to grow. but uh, at the other extreme, the positive thing that we took away from the last quarter's earnings is that the cost per unit or the cost, uh, um, the cost of manufacturing goods has also started declining uh, significantly faster than, uh, than, your, than your sales growth. So corporate India is getting cost and control. The sales growth is something that they just cannot control. It's largely driven by the uh, external environment. So the external environment has been slowing down ex for the last two, uh, for the last three years now, okay, and it's probably hit its all-time low in the last quarter. Uh, March is going to be extremely interesting, but the feelers that we get from 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 ground realities is that it's not really coming back, and March is March is very critical for India because 40 percent of all sales gets done during March, so it's extremely critical that this quarter actually gets through. So why is it slowing down? It's obviously a macro condition, a macro reason why it's slowing down. Uh, when it will pick up, it also has to be a macro reason why it will actually pick, it will actually have to come come back again. And, and would you also say that there would typically be a lag effect, right? Because just because inflation has fallen the last few months doesn't mean the earnings will spike back almost immediately. Yeah, it's always always a lag effect. You also need to remember that in the last. Uh, last six years, India has not seen any significant investment in anything, okay? Uh, and most of the large projects that have been taken up have all gotten stuck midway. So there's no earning capacity also there. Uh, the only uh, sweet spot that existed for, for India in the last couple of years was rural, in, rural wage growth, okay, or rural income growth, whichever way you want to call it. And that was the mainstay of holding profitability in the sector for some time. Even that's effectively uh, um, at a risk at this point in time. 
So we hit a low out there, and uh, and and corporate earnings will come back with a, obviously it comes back with a lag. So we'll have to see how the macros actually evolve over the next couple of uh, couple of quarters. You, you wanted to. It's a very good question. See, uh, there's only one reason I can tell you why FDI is not coming the way it should. Ease of doing business in India. It's really terrible. Uh, what did we do to POSCO? By far the biggest investment in one of the best sectors which can absorb investment. We shunted them all over the place. What did we do with Nokia? Nokia is planning to move almost its entire uh, manufacturing to Chennai and other locations. We thumped them with so much of tax and, uh, you know, we almost, uh, and the entire Nokia acquisition by Microsoft was excluding India. Vodafone, they had such big plans. And then you slap some uh, uh, back, back taxes, which was totally reprehensible. So we have been putting self-goal after self-goal uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and uh, hopefully with better transfer pricing regulations, with, with advanced uh, rulings, etc., we have to give the business confidence. And that's totally, all that we can say is, uh, life is very bad for foreign businessmen. It's equally bad for Indian businessmen. That's the only solace we can give foreigners. You are not getting any special treatment. We are also being subjected to the, to the same. Uh, well, ho ho hopefully that will change. Hopefully. Yes, the gentleman there at the back. Yes. If you could just stand up, please. Then the mic will come across quickly to you. Yes. Can we get a mic, mic across there? During cocktails, you can ask Nilesh what shares he's buying. He's told me he'll tell you. <laughs> I'll say right now, why on cocktail? So I buy Kotak Select Focus Fund, Kotak Energy <laughs> <Focus> Fund. <laughs> no, I'm not going to allow you to do that. Not on the panel. <laughs> so coming, coming yes. back to the discussion around the fiscal deficit and uh, increased shares to the uh, states from 32% to 42%. Don't you think that the finance minister was uh, comfortable doing that because not only the oil prices were down, but they also saw much higher revenues coming from the coal block auctions and uh, the spectrum auctions and also the thinking to, to put the PSUs back on the divestment side. That's the first question. Then the second one is because of this higher uh, revenues coming in from the coal and telecom auctions, would you think that there would be an inflationary impact on the electricity and uh, telecom tariffs. Mr. Vijay, do you want to take them? Yeah, these are sort of some anxieties we have. On the uh, 32 to 42, uh, it is an award. And unless only once, I think, in India's history, the central government has not fully accepted the Finance uh, Commission's recommendations. So that is a constraint which the central government uh, will have to live in. And uh, it, it's an anxiety I have, I'll tell you why. Now big money, it's like Sarva Siksha Abhyan and many other schemes, good marquee schemes, are going to go totally to the uh, states. And their capacity to absorb it and to implement it in a non-corrupt fashion is very doubtful. So this award as ready has not taken into account at all the implementation issues. But it's a fact of life. On the coal blocks, every paisa goes to the states. The eight states. The center doesn't get a pie because this comes as uh, royalty and, and leases. And that's uh, a purview of the state governments. So state governments have got huge bonanza, 14 finance commission plus uh, coal. On the spectrum auction, as Nilesh said at the outset, uh, the government has a few things up its sleeve, actually. Uh, you know, mm, uh, aces up its sleeve. And uh, these would be used. I think uh, the, the auction money, most of it will come in 15, 16, not most of it, some of it, and balance in 15, 17. Those will all be used, I think, to keep the numbers uh, fairly solid and holy. And I don't think these are inflationary. As long as investment leads to production and improved productivity. If you saw the survey, the survey, for example, said the block projects to GDP ratio had hit an all-time high, but Modi has brought it down by 2% to about 7%, which means the amount of money which is lying in blocked projects 
is there. If you are able to unblock that also, the investment has mostly taken place that's leading to production and consumption, which is not inflationary. So I'm just hoping that if we are able to use all this money productively, uh, then uh, it won't be inflationary. Yes. Can I answer him on inflation side? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you just add to the first question? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, is there any chartered accountant in this audience? No. So I am the only chartered accountant. Uh, there is one guy at the back. Yeah. Okay. okay. Then I have a company. So the inflation in India is accounted by statisticians. And inflation in America is accounted by chartered accountants. If we give this job to chartered accountants, then inflation will never be there in India. And I'll demonstrate how. So suppose if you have iPhone 5 at $100, and you introduce iPhone 6 at $200, the Indian statistician account this as 100% inflation. 100 on 100, 100% inflation. But the American chartered accountant accounts this as a 0% inflation, saying that between iPhone 5 and iPhone 6, the shutter speed has gone up, camera has increased, quality of processing has increased, the size has increased, and hence that 100 rupee price increase is only for the efficiency. So it is 0% inflation. So when we present our inflation numbers, it is statistician's number. The world presents inflation number as accountant's number. There is a big, big difference. Second, the stupidity of Indian statistician is like this. So in our CPI, a very reasonably high percentage is for housing cost. How do you calculate housing cost? It is based on HR allowances paid by government and private sector companies. And how does HR allowance of government and private sector calculate it? It is based on CPI. <laughs> so you are doing this round tripping to create inflation in India. So we need to give accountants more jobs. And then you can be rest assured that will prove that proverb correct. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yes, such a Go. Yeah, so, uh, and if that accountant happened to be a good Jew, then, then, then obviously the numbers can be very different. Sachindra bhai, ek good Jew PME kafi hai. So this, this, uh, Bain Vijay, this is for you. Like, it's less of a, a budget or economic question, more of a political question. See, <clears throat> do you think that this, so one thing is very clear. India's economic development is not a one-year journey, not a two-year journey, because we're coming from a very, very bad management for our last seven years or so. Anybody expecting that we could be able to revive that in one year is, is so it, take, it will take minimum of seven years for us to get to a 12.5% growth rate. So do you think this government has erred in, uh, in being at least some populist in the budget? Because one of the things is this government should always keep it in mind that it has to remain in power for at least that period of time and it has to keep winning in some of those critical places. So do you come into an absolute power? You are saying it should be more populist. Yes, I am saying at least some more populism has to be there. It is in the interest of this country that this government lasts for minimum seven to eight years, which means at least two term. And if that objective is lost, India would lose big time. You don't want repeat of 2005. You want this to continue. Well, uh, I think the, the thinking is uh, to, to go really gungo, at least for the first two to three years. Uh, tax kam kar sakte uh, Thoda tamara tax kam kar sakte <laughs> You see, uh, what will happen? Bihar. Uh, Bihar, to my sense, is totally on caste lines. Nothing to do with uh, economics. Uh, then Bihar, Punjab again, or West Bengal. I think uh, if you can keep inflation under check, basically, uh, you're okay. So I think uh, whatever uh, you know, sexy stuff that we suited and booted people like will happen this budget and next budget, I think. 
uh, and hope to get production going and hope to, uh, you know, um, uh, after that, uh, uh, you know, I don't think, frankly, uh, if you ask me, Sachin, BJP lost 2004 uh, for not being populist. They got the electoral arithmetic wrong. Frankly, uh, they uh, backed Jayalalta when she was the worst thing. They backed uh, Chandra Babu Naidu when he was just too unpopular. So there are some mistakes like that. I think if you are genuine and you try to improve infrastructure, quality of life, and keep inflation low, because inflation can kill anybody, uh, you can come back to power. I think, uh, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah sorry, one sec. See, again, you need good to chartered accountants. <laughs> so I'll give you two incidences whereby we can change India's complexion. So very recently, uh, in Africa, South Africa was the largest GDP country. But very recently, suddenly, Nigeria became the largest GDP country. And what did they do? They went to IMF and said that, look, in our country, we have a lot of black economy, a lot of parallel economy. And we have to measure it. And you come and experience, we have so much of parallel economy. So we are estimating it roughly like this. And we are jumping our GDP by 62%. So in one year, the GDP jumped 62%, blessed by IMF. And they toppled South Africa as the world's, Africa's largest economy and made it number two. Now we have to invite IMF to India. They will automatically understand how much black economy we have. So we'll become a faster GDP country. And as Dr. Y.B. Reddy mentioned, that in other markets, future is uncertain. In India, even the past is uncertain. <laughs> and we have seen our GDP numbers, where even governor accepts that, you know, it's difficult to understand. <laughs> but suppose if we don't want to follow African model, then, then there is American model to follow. So what has US done? How many of you like gone, gone with the winds? Great. So. Americans have used people like you and said like gone with the wind is never made for one year. You will enjoy it after 50 years. So I want to capitalize comics, movies, artifacts, paintings, and some of the other things which I can mention in this audience. And they have bumped up the GDP by 3%. By 3%. Now we can capitalize right from Vedas, Upanishads, Mahabharat, Ramayana, Taj Mahal, and so many other things. So leave the job to Gujju Chartered Accountants. We'll create whatever denominator you want. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, go ahead. This is a question to Nilesh. First thing, compliments to you for making things so simple for investors. Uh, my comments on uh, why didn't we invest in Maruti or Nestle or... You see, uh, most of the investors here retail investors, whether HNI or LNI, or, uh, they work still on tips. The role of advisors, fund managers, or uh, consultants and all is, is dicey. Whether they are working on uh, correct information, they are giving advice on correct information, and their accountability. You see, you refer to uh, large caps and concentrating on large caps between uh, 2009 or 12. The large caps, most of the funds did very bad, maybe negative returns, uh, so there are extraneous reasons, there are information flow, the promoters or manipulators of the market, they have correct information, they can influence decision makers to take decision in their favor. And this, all this information is not available uh, through advisors or consultants to the retail client. Retail client has no source, either economic time, business standard or your advice, uh, your, your brochures and all. So we have been largely working on what you have been advising. So uh, why didn't we buy Maruti? Maybe for that reason. Why didn't we buy Nestle for that reason? No, 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 no. Very easy to blame it. Huh? No, no. Let me. You didn't you. buy it because you were looking at the tip only. Huh? See, uh, have you read Mahabharat? Of course, all of us would have. Which is the best couplet of Mahabharat? So this is my best couplet, and obviously your choice could be different. So before the war was beginning. Krishna goes to Duryodhan and he says, Ki bhai, kyon fight mar hai? You just give five villages to Pandavas and I will ensure that they give up their right on the half the kingdom. 
And Duryodhan replies that I will not even give an inch of land to Pandavas. Then Krishna explains to Duryodhan that boss, what you are doing is wrong. They are your half brothers. They legitimately deserved half of the kingdom. You wager a bet with them. They have won that bet. Now give half the kingdom to them. And then Duryodhan gives reply to Krishna. Jana me dharmam, nach me pravrutti. Jana me adharmam, nach me nivrutti. So Duryodhan says, Oh great Krishna, please don't teach me what is right. I exactly know what is right. My problem is that I can't follow it. <laughs> and don't tell me what is wrong. I mean, I understand I am doing wrong, but my problem is that I cannot escape from it. So each of us has that Duryodhan in our mind, and we know what is right. The right thing for you to be a long-term investor in equity. Instead of painting house, if you had bought Asian paint shares, you would have moved from one bedroom to four bedroom. <laughs> Instead of buying Maruti car, if you had bought Maruti shares, you would be traveling in Mercedes. So, each one, of, each one of us knows what is the truth. The problem is the temptations are so much, fear is so much, greed is so much. Now, this is, you know, very simple thing and it might look like a self-praise, but so be it. The world's best investor is Warren Buffet, he is the god. There is no doubt about it, there is only one God in the world and he is Warren Buffet. All of us have grown worshipping him. Now if Warren Buffet was an Indian mutual fund manager, what do you think would have happened? I mean people would have lined to invest with him, but he would have lost his job. Before coming here I did an analysis where within my my acceptable peer group, the worst performing equity fund between 1998 to 2015 has delivered four times more return than Warren Buffet in US dollar terms. The worst performing Indian fund manager is four times better than the God himself. And despite that, we hear that boss, we couldn't invest. Now, after delivering four times more return than the God himself, what can we do? All right, on that extremely, what should I say, soul-stirring, you know, food for thought, uh, I'm going to close this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth, Vijay and uh, Nilesh. And uh, over to you, uh, Subhanshu. Thanks a lot. And... Uh, <clears throat> We didn't know that fund managers are serious people. We always knew that they're serious people. We didn't know that they have an uncanny and fantastic sense. So, a big hand for Nilesh. I was trying Mr. to Vijay. take the job of the stand-up <laughs> comedian. <laughs> we'll have that. We'll have that after this. And Kenneth. Uh, but before I, we, we kind of let you go, uh, I'd request Sriram Ayer and Gaurav Arora to just come up on stage and felicitate uh, the speakers and the panelists, please. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Sriram and Gaurav, I'm going to hold you back. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'd request Sriram Ayer, who's the Chief Business Officer for Relega Private Wealth, and Gaurav Arora, the CIO. Just say a few words and, you know, walk you through our operating philosophy. So I think I just want to uh, <laughs> promise not to take uh, 
precisely between the two of us, seven to eight minutes. Um, you know, I think Sachin said the context by saying that uh, Religare Private Wealth, and it was the erstwhile Religare Macquarie, and you know, a lot of you would have been familiar with that brand name. Uh, we thought it was best to be run by an Indian group uh, because Indians know Indians best. And I think uh, that's really the reason why Religare decided to sort of uh, buy the entire stake from Macquarie. So for the last two years, uh, you know, early 2013 is when uh, you know, Religare acquired the entire stake in Religare Private Wealth. So we are truly embedded within the uh, Religare ecosystem. Um, you would have seen the breadth and depth of uh, expertise that Religare as a group brings to the table across asset management to uh, lending, the NBFC to insurance, uh, and of course capital markets, which is the business that we are a part of. So there is this entire array of products, capabilities, and solutions that we are in a very unique position to access, which I think very few uh, wealth management firms in the country really have access to. I think that's a unique capability that Religare Private Wealth brings to the table. Point number two, uh, in spite of the fact that we are uh, you know, integrated and you know, well within the Religare ecosystem, we continue to maintain our independence, and we are one of the few uh, SEBI registered investment advisor. So we understand that managing money is a fiduciary responsibility. And therefore, uh, we scan the entire market for opportunities for you and not necessarily only from within the group. While, with, while the capability exists, while we can and we do bring some interesting transactions and uh, opportunities to you, other than the BAU advice and asset allocation that we do, uh, we also bring open market ideas. So the open architecture framework uh, is something that's a part of the DNA of this of this firm. Um, I just want to I just want to quickly hand over the mic to my colleague uh, Gaurav, who is the chief investment officer for Religare Private Wealth. He'll uh, take you through the, the the couple of next couple of slides. As I promised, I've taken three minutes. I promise he'll take three more minutes, and we'll then break. Over to you, Gaurav. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I thought I'll spend a quick two minutes trying to kind of probably discuss that. Uh, as a part of a, a team of very young, experienced uh, professional wealth managers at here at Religare Private Wealth, and as a CIO here, uh, what takes most of our time in the day trying to manage wealth for you esteemed gentlemen here? When I st got stopped in my tracks by one of our very experienced and ex um, esteemed clients here who asked me, uh, Gaurav, what's your total number of years of experience because your card reads a CIO? So, and uh, I suddenly stumbled back and I thought probably, yeah, that experience is very dwarfed in terms uh, against the uh, immense experience of all you gentlemen present here. Uh, but then I pulled back my thoughts uh, to some of the, uh, a lot of action which has been happening in the markets around regulations, around tax regimes, uh, you know, around global market expectations on flows in the Indian markets. You know, so the variables have just been multiplying exponentially. And what we as a team here have probably gained in the last 10 years out of that has been an exceptionally steep learning curve. Uh, only for us to realize time and more, again, that what we are trying to do here in terms of creating ex uh, uh, some platforms for managing wealth for you ex um, esteemed gentlemen by putting our mind, heart and soul behind it is a lot of science, a lot of knowledge being trying to wo be woven in the action-packed activity which is happening in the markets today. Um, so uh, that's what taking forward from what uh, our CEO Sachin also uh, shared. What we are here trying to offer you is trying to pick the best of the ideas from the Religare ecosystem and the industry at large and just putting our tri expertise and platforms behind it to keep managing your wealth, preserving it and growing it as we go forward. We're happy to have you as a part of our family and thank you for being part of the Religare Private family. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, please. Thank <laughs> you.